The facts are, as a process of we clearly know, that producers will either sell live or look to fatten and slaughter. And Luke gave uh, a fairly clear overview in terms of the opportunities that exist for, especially Kimberley and uh, Eastern, sorry, Western uh, Territory producers in terms of the live game. They haven't got many opportunities, that's a fact. From a processor's perspective, improved transport infrastructure is critical. We can't mill, the producers can't move them, we can't process them, simple as that. If you look at it, the movement of fat cattle, say in places like Clean Country, Tennant Creek and around the Alice, that's a challenge. If you look at an example of Alice Springs to Dinmore, and Dinmore being Australia's largest meat processing facility just outside of Brisbane, the challenge is there. Along the Plenty Highway to Bullia, either road direct or rail to Winton, 2,600 kilometres. You know, some of these cattle have got more frequent flyer points than most politicians. These areas include the Channel Country, a long and slow in terms of their fattening operations. As an old producer told me once, out of 10 years we have two good, three average and five bad seasons. We as a company and others look to consolidate slaughter cattle at Mount Isa and move by rail from Cloncurry uh, to Dinmore to Townsville, that's 900 kilometres, we, and we rest and spell, then to Dinmore, it's a total of 1,700 kilometres. So I agree with the comments which were in the Fin Review this week by both Alison Watkins of uh, Grain Corp and David Farley. Uh, concerning the risk of our competitiveness through lack of investment in infrastructure and the effects on productivity. The cost to move product internally and to export markets is expensive and certainly impacts upon our effectiveness and efficiency and our competitiveness. You know, we have a simple supply chain model here which operates on very small margins. People forget this. We're not the mining sector. We are a four to five percent maximum return on investment. And as we continually debate about our competitiveness, and I think the word competitiveness can be misused in a lot of cases, but the facts are, in processing terms, Australia is a high cost to operate. We need cost taken out, not cost put on us. The photo you see there is on the right is our Dinmore facility. Uh, this time last year, as a business, um, we were quite liquid, literally. We had the Bremer River up to our back steps and um, we were working hard to make sure it didn't totally inundate our facility. I alluded to earlier what the challenges are from a processor's perspective in Northern Australia. And it's not just Northern Australia. Market access is critical. We need to maintain and expand. Beef producers demand competition and a range of market opportunities. Processors operate in a highly competitive international marketplace. The facts are we are price takers, we're not price makers. It just amazes me that, you know, I talk to politicians and I talk to a range of people and they think that you're big, you're profitable. Or the meat processing industry can continue to, to cop cost. Well, I'm sorry, we are a big industry, but we are a business of small margins. If you look at the trade issues in recent times, you know, it's imperative that government work with industry. And again, I come back to it, whether it be DFAT or DAF, mixed messages are often sent to these agencies who are negotiating market access on our behalf. And the frustration that occurs when you know, negotiators say, well, someone told me this or someone told me that. A classic example is the recent FTA with Korea. And I'm not having a cheap shot at the industry, but we were never going to get what the Americans got. Until we get seven aircraft carriers and 100,000 troops on the peninsula, we're not going to have the leverage. So we're in a situation today in that the Americans have negotiated an FTA. They will, based on currency and plus the 2% benefit, be much more competitive in that market. A market Australia in recent times, and our company especially, have been instrumental in driving opportunities. We flagged before, and Trish and her presentation, about new processing opportunities. 
As I said, the North Queensland Townsville is the last of the export plants. I worked for a company, AMH, where we closed a lot of plants. And the fact was, why we closed plants was we consolidated invested in Dinmore and other assets. So today you've got Dinmore, which is the largest meat processing facility in Australia, processes 3,500 head of cattle a day. Those cattle come from all over, the, all over northern Australia and the Territory. So to work the scale, to be internationally competitive, that's where our investment strategy was. But it's great to see that we've got entrepreneurial spirit now in terms of David Farley and AAK's vision for Darwin and also the work that's been done in terms of looking at Cloncurry. But uh, as I said earlier, this is not a, a processing is not a game for the faint-hearted. Um, you know, what we're seeing is a number of these models built around integrated supply arrangements, consolidating cattle close to the plant. You see, you know, Darwin has got the capacity in terms of cow bull product, but seasonal supply and access to fatter cattle will be a challenge. Cloncurry, on the other hand, centrally located to cow bull, plus also you know, fat cattle north or south. But what we continue to see in this part of the world is the seasonal effects, variability in quality, the numbers, and importantly, capital cost of greenfield uh, facilities, labour supply, utility cost, and importantly, transporting this product to market. For people who don't know, the Port of Brisbane is the largest beef export port in the country, and all product out of the north goes through Brisbane. We had access to the US through towns in the past and also Port Alma at Rockhampton, but now everything goes through Brisbane. So the facts are that, as I've said, the meat processing industry is a high capital cost, labour intensive, low margin business. We need to maximise the value for every part of the animal. And that's today where livestock prices are, are strong. The currency is above parity, so we need to maximise the value for every part of the animal. We have controllable costs, which in the case of our, our, our business, 20% of the input cost, or 70% of that 20% is labour. We're seeing wages on cost of around 32 to 42%. Turnover, especially in the unskilled areas, of around 70%. Mining continues, especially in Queensland, to be a competitor for labour, and also rail infrastructure access. We move a lot of cattle, both ourselves and Tees Brothers, along rail. And we are seeing more and more challenges in terms of slots due to the mining sector. One of the important issues that we are changing and we're looking to work with, and we were the first company in Queensland to sign an EB, Enterprise Bargaining Agreement, is we now need to link increases in salaries to productivity. The days of 4%, 4%, 4%, sorry, are gone. And we're looking to work with the unions and the workforce in this cultural change. I come to the regulatory control and taxes. We as an industry have worked with AQUIS and the department in terms of the inspection reform agenda. But in, the outcome of that was we changed the model. We are continuing to look at this model. In our case, we saw an additional $4 million of cost come to us, primarily due to the fact of the cost re full cost recovery policy of the, of the federal government. If you look at Brazil or the US, they do not pay these inspection costs. That's an important issue. We're competing every day against those two countries in the international marketplace. We, as I said earlier, we have to drive cost out of our business and we need to work with government to identify those areas where costs can be taken out. In the case of the carbon tax, we've had very good dialogue with the federal government through Joe Ludwig's office and also Greg Combe's office. But the point being is that we have a number of our sites which are over the 25,000 tonnes. So we're going to be paying $23 per tonne from 1 July. So therefore we have a two-tiered system in this country now in processing terms. Those over the 25, those under. So people are going to make commercial decisions. I'm pleased to, to say, however, that we are getting traction with the federal government. They are understanding the challenges we face as a manufacturer and hopefully priority will be giving to, given to those projects funding for those over the 25,000 tonnes. But the fact is we run the, the risk, the real risk of pricing ourselves potentially out of the market. And government needs to understand that this is an industry in a very challenging environment. In closing, 
I'd like to leave you with these points. Our view is that the response to industry challenges is we need to adapt our businesses to a prolonged period of a high Australian dollar. Sticking our head in the sand and saying we're going to go back to 80 cents tomorrow, well, you know, fairies at the bottom of the garden. We need to have a sustainable and profitable supply chain. Both producers and processors need to be long-term sustainable. We need the delivery of market access. Importantly for the North to be developed, we need a high profile initiative which has all stakeholders sign on. I said before we need a strong and unified industry position, one voice to government. Again, if we don't, we will die. And the government and the opposition have to have a shared vision. It needs to be bipartisan. It can't be that Labor has this position, Tony Abbott and his team have this position. And importantly, the amount of people I see up on the hill who think they understand this industry, well, I think we need a refresher course to tell you the truth, because quite clearly, a lot of the views are being driven out the back window or off the back of um, hotel coasters. Seriously, the point is, the industry itself needs to better communicate what we're doing, who we are, and what we need. So I suppose in closing, I'll leave you with our views as a processor in terms of the challenges, but clearly there are opportunities in the north, and collectively we need to have government, industry working together. To me, it's a bit like as a Queenslander I saw how the state government worked on the development of Gladstone. Gladstone was a caravan park there at one stage when I was a kid. And uh, I remember a, a thesis that was written called Busting with the Boom in the, in the late 70s. And the government and industry put a peg in the sand and said, we can do this. The infrastructure was there. There was a commitment by government. It sent the right messages to the private sector and investment came. There's no reason why we can't use a similar model for Northern Australia. Thank you very much.